Lin and Tian confront a mysterious monster. As they confront this creature, Lin senses a mix of confusion, fear, pain, and despair emanating from it, leading him to believe that it might possess some form of spiritual energy. Lin quickly asks Tian if she has anything to bind the wraith, and Tian responds by invoking her superpower, the soul-binding lash of the four holy beasts. They attempt to restrain the monster, which is desperately trying to escape their grasp. In a dramatic display of power, Lin uses his power of mountain-shaking fist, creating a massive crater in the ground. Ken is surprised by the extent of the destruction and assumes the monster isn't as powerful as they thought. However, the monster draws their attention to something within the crater. The monster points out a bundle of spider silk within the crater, suggesting that it holds significant importance to it. Lin and Tan consider covering the crater to prevent the villagers from discovering it, but the monster chides them for not recognizing the value of the loot they've obtained after defeating the monster. As the monster tries to make off with its loot, it is interrupted by an anonymous voice. The voice belongs to none other than the Demon King of Wisdom, who confronts Lin and Tian for interfering with its possessions. Lin brings up the spider silk in the crater, indicating its importance, but Tian notes that something about the Demon King seems abnormal. The monster, still in character, worries that it may have been discovered, but continues to engage in combat with Lin and Tian. It reveals that the stolen item is snow spider silk. Despite the intense battle, a monster eventually decides to retreat, leaving behind the spider silk. Lin reflects on the encounter, noting that he didn't even use his full power against the monster, and yet it fled and left the valuable silk behind. In a demon palace, a demon warrior checks in on the demon king's mission. The monster, now revealed to be the demon king himself, reassures the demon warrior that despite a minor hiccup during the mission, it was accomplished thanks to its peerless acting skills. The demon warrior expresses satisfaction with the outcome and hints at a rejuvenation process for their kind, signifying that this mission might have played a crucial role in their plans. The scene is set in the Crown Hotel in Rong City, where Huang, Lin, Cheng, Xu, and Tian are discussing their mission. They own a bundle of spider silk that belongs to the demon king known as the Hundred Eye Spider. This silk has the power to attach two ghosts and absorb the life energy of humans. Huang expresses concerns about the thinness of the silk, making it challenging for them to track down the demon spider. Lin reminds the group that their primary missions are to strengthen the seal on the demon tower and eliminate the demon king. Cheng raises the question of whether the Demon King of Wisdom, who appeared unexpectedly, is allied with the Hundred Eyes Spider. Huang suggests that the sudden appearance of the Demon King may be a ploy to use them to eliminate the spider. Xu adds that it could also be a trap. Despite the risks, Tian insists they cannot let this opportunity slip by, but they need spiritual rocks as rewards to recruit help. Lin offers to provide some spiritual rocks, but Tian mentions that higher stage cultivators are expensive. Tian calculates that they need 500 spiritual rocks to recruit three cultivators at the initial soul period and 10 cultivators at the 10th stage. As they continue their conversation, a sudden thunderstorm strikes, causing the weather to deteriorate rapidly. Xu remarks sarcastically that their plans for shopping are ruined and they will have to stay in the hotel. Lin then asks Tian if he has a kite. Confused, Chun inquires about the purpose of a kite. Ignoring the worsening weather, Lin starts flying a kite. Chu tries to stop Lin, urging him not to do something foolish and suggesting they return to the hotel. Tian, however, encourages Lin, emphasizing that he must survive because he can't afford to pay for the recruitment of cultivators. He adds a sarcastic comment about writing down their wills. Suddenly, the system interjects with a condition to unlock the first stage of the lightning origin Taoist technique. Lin realizes that he needs to be struck by lightning to learn this technique. Additionally, he recalls that he has already learned the Earth Lotus Divine Technique and another technique, which means he can ascend to the tenth stage of the Taoist body. Lin eagerly anticipates the incoming lightning strike, seeing it as an opportunity to achieve both goals simultaneously. As the lightning bolt approaches, Lin becomes unconscious. Chin panics and shouts Lin's name in concern. Lin regains consciousness after being struck by lightning. Tian, relieved that Lin is awake, asks if he's alright. Lin inquires about his success, and the system confirms that he has achieved the first stage of the lightning origin technique and has learned three different techniques from the system. They are now about to begin the breakthrough. Tu expresses concern for Lin's well-being and informs him that he has been unconscious for three days since the lightning strike. Lin, undeterred, asks if the cultivators they were expecting have arrived during his absence. Tan informs him that they have gathered at the hotel since yesterday. Lin is pleased with the news and suggests preparing to head to the Demon Tower. At Mount Kunlun, the group marvels at the magnificent scenery. They learn that the Demon Tower is located on this mountain, which is the origin of the Chinese Dragon Stream. Huang warns them that while there are elite cultivators here, 
there are also powerful monsters. Tin mentions that the supporting cultivators have hidden in the vicinity. Cheng points out that a seal has been placed on the tower to suppress its dense demonic power. Suddenly, the spider silk in the area starts to react and Tian becomes entangled in it. Lin rushes to his aid, worried about his friend's well-being. A horrifying spider-like monster emerges, taking everyone by surprise with its incredible speed. Xu urges them to apply their divine techniques and Huang remarks on the monster's power, noting that it destroyed all the Demon King's spider silk with a single attack. Lin takes decisive action and skillfully cuts the monster into two parts using a technique that utilizes the enemy's strength against itself. Chan is in awe of Lin's graceful and powerful technique, while Huang and Chang praise Lin's talent and terrifying potential. Chang playfully teases the two for becoming cheerleaders, indicating their admiration for Lin's abilities. The Demon Kings, Blackheart, Pain, Rage, and Wisdom discuss their plans. They mention that half of the Demon Realm's forces have been sent for this hunt, emphasizing the importance of their mission. They plan to take care of the spirit-nurturing stage cultivators and make their move once the Hundred-Eye Spider is dead. Demon King Wisdom is concerned about the Demon Emperor's plan to empower the Blood Signet Tablet and emphasizes that it must not fail. Lin confidently announces the death of the Hundred-Eye Spider. The Demon Kings taunt Lin and his allies, urging them to give up their hearts quietly. The Demon King of Rage offers a quick death as a reward for surrender. The Demon Kings laugh terribly. Cheng, unimpressed by their outdated threats, questions their ability to adapt to the times. This earns him a response from one of the Demon Kings, who claims to have lured them with his acting skills. Lin privately thinks that the Demon King's acting skills deserve nothing more than a Golden Raspberry Award. The Demon King suspects that the Demon Emperor has sent other Demon Kings to join the battle due to the powerful aura they sense. The fellow Demon King confirms that human cultivators have also arrived. God and other cultivators arrive on the scene, and God proclaims that the Demon Kings have been surrounded. He offers them a quick death if they surrender. Lin finds God's script just as poorly written as the Demon King's threats and wonders why it's so badly written. The Demon Kings express confusion about how their plan was exposed and suspect each other. One Demon King who had the chance to undertake missions outside is particularly investigated. Lin decides to add fuel to the fire and sarcastically suggests that it wasn't the Demon King of Wisdom who exposed their plans, further complicating the situation. The Demon King denies involvement and claims the mission was executed perfectly. Lin decides to worsen the situation further, hoping to divert their attention. Lin sarcastically refers to the Demon King of Wisdom as Uncle Wisdom and questions why he's still pretending. The Demon King vehemently denies the familial title and swears that if he's a traitor, he'll be struck by lightning. In an unexpected turn of events, lightning falls upon the Demon King of Wisdom, shocking everyone. Wisdom attempts to explain it as an accident, and Lin realizes that he can use the recently learned call lightning technique to his advantage. The Demon Kings are puzzled, as only the Demon Emperor can summon lightning. Lin seizes the opportunity to rally his group to protect Wisdom, referring to him as Wisdom Bro. Wisdom is bewildered by Lin's sudden familiarity, asking who his brother is. The other Demon Kings start attacking Wisdom, accusing him of betrayal. Lin dramatically declares that Wisdom's brother has been killed and urges his allies to avenge him. Lin privately reflects that while the remaining 20 Demon Kings still have numerical superiority, their 10 recruited supporters are all at the 10th stage of power. With their newfound strength, Lin declares victory as they prepare to face off against the Demon Kings. Lin faces a looming attack. It appears that an attacker is about to strike, but before they can act, Huang takes swift action. He fires a shot that hits Lin's potential attacker, taking them down. Huang proudly states his mastery of firearms, emphasizing that he wasn't joking about his skills. This bold act of heroism makes Lin grateful for his friend's quick reflexes, and he inwardly reflects on the fortunate outcome, glad that the gunshot didn't accidentally go off. He opens a box and seems to discover something inside. Lin acknowledges his momentary carelessness and resolves to change his ways, even deciding to adopt a new title for himself, calling himself Immortal Lin. Intriguingly, Lin uses his powers to confuse a demon that appears, challenging its intentions. The demon asks him whether he's here for sword fighting or a duel. The system, which seems to be a guiding or assisting entity, communicates with Lin. It offers him a book from its sect, mentioning five spiritual rocks and suggesting he can learn more about swimming and bodybuilding. Lin appears to be interested in the offer, even though it's unexpected. He agrees to the deal, showing his willingness to explore new skills and knowledge. Meanwhile, in a divine realm, the gods are observing the unfolding events. They discuss the fate of the Demon Kings, expressing doubt about their survival. The Demon Kings, however, are willing to go down without a fight, defiantly declaring their intent to bring down mortals with them. 
A fierce battle unfolds between the Savior wielding a lightsaber and the Demon King. The Savior appears to be a formidable force, engaging the Demon King in an intense fight. Amidst the chaos, one of the cultivators realizes that the Demon King is attempting to escape and urges others to pursue him. However, Lin intervenes and successfully stops the Demon King's escape attempts repeatedly. The Demon King is frustrated by his inability to break through Lin's defenses and escape. He acknowledges that despite his efforts, Lin continuously thwarts his every move, leaving him with no choice but to take a life-threatening risk. As the struggle continues, the god overseeing the events intervenes, questioning the Demon King's escape attempt. The Demon King defiantly declares that he will take down everyone with him. Cultivator steps forward, determined to finish the job, claiming expertise in slaying enemies at opportune moments. The god, however, asserts confidence in their ability to defeat the Demon King. Lin continues to press the Demon King, giving him no respite. The Demon King, refusing to surrender, maintains his resolve to resist capture or escape by any means necessary. An unexpected turn of events occurs. The Demon King begins to experience something unusual, which leaves him bewildered and vulnerable. Lin seizes this moment and reveals that the wounds inflicted on the Demon King were a result of a technique called the Heaven Chains Sword Technique. In a sarcastic tone, Lin congratulates the Demon King for being captured alive, effectively ending the intense battle. God confronts the Demon King, pressing him for answers regarding the plot to trap and ambush human cultivators at the spirit-nurturing stage. The Demon King remains defiant and curses them, wishing eternal suffering upon them in the Demon Kingdom. Lin recognizes that they have no choice but to proceed with the interrogation. He asks the others who would like to go first in attempting to extract information from the stubborn Demon King. The Savior volunteers and reveals a pain-amplifying drug stolen from a top-notch bio-lab. This drug makes the person's entire nervous system highly receptive to pain, inflicting despair on the heart. Despite the excruciating agony, the Demon King resolutely refuses to divulge any information. The God steps up next, followed by Lin, each inflicting more pain on the Demon King, who cries out in anguish. It becomes evident that the Demon King is a tough nut to crack, and his resolve remains unbroken. At this juncture, Xiao Hong proposes a different approach. She mentions that during her time when she was close to forming a demon core, she awakened a supernatural power known as Greater Charm. Lin and the others inquire about this power, and Xiao explains that it allows her to invoke a person's desires, and when they are in a state of ecstasy and euphoria, mentally intrude into their mind and make them obedient to her commands. The Savior, in a tone of sarcasm and anger, questions Xiao Hong about her use of this power on the flower demon. Xiao reveals that she needs someone to serve as a template so she can create an appealing appearance and ask the Demon King questions. The group begins refusing the role of being the template for Xiao Hong's power. Xu and Tian decline, offering their reasons while Cheng, God, and Savior provide excuses. All eyes eventually turn to Lin, who vehemently refuses and protests against cross-dressing. Xiao reassures Lin that she will imagine him as the world's sexiest and hottest beauty, but Lin insists that this isn't the point. Desperate to avoid the task, Lin pleads with someone to take the Demon King away. The atmosphere is charged with excitement and anticipation as everyone encourages Lin to prepare for what's to come. They express their eagerness for the transformation that's about to take place. Chan and Xexu, with their cameras ready, start taking pictures of Lin as preparations for the transformation begin. Lin playfully scolds them to stop their enthusiastic clicking. Lin instructs Xiao, who is tasked with recording the transformation to be quick. Xiao offers suggestions regarding the ideal body structure for the transformation, emphasizing a larger and sharper body with an e-cup size and a slim waist. Lin, seemingly impatient, tells Xiao to speed up the process. With the preparations complete, Lin enters the scene as a beautiful lady. Her goal is to extract the truth from Demon King Blackheart's mouth, but she can't help feeling embarrassed by the transformation. The Demon King, taken aback by Lin's appearance, pleads for her to stay away from him. Threatening to reveal the information Lin seeks if she continues to approach him. Xiao seizes the opportunity to question the Demon King about his motives for orchestrating events to force those at the soul development stage to appear. The Demon King reveals that they plan to activate the Devil Emperor's Blood Signet Tablet, which requires the lives of human cultivators at the soul development phase. Xiao further inquires about the Demon Emperor's goal in activating the Signet. The Demon King explains that the Blood Signet is a magic item given by the God of the Kindred from the West. It allows the Demon Emperor to absorb the blood essence of cultivators, heal his mind, and increase his power. This revelation surprises the gathered cultivators, as the kindred and fiends are traditionally considered enemies. The god present in the scene provides insight into the Demon Emperor's history. 
Five years ago, the Demon Emperor's roots were destroyed by Master Zhang from the soul-snuffing lightning. The Demon Emperor had since disappeared into the mountains. The question arises whether the Blood Segnet can heal such a severe wound. Lin, however, clarifies that the Blood Segnet's purpose is not to restore the Demon Emperor's roots, but to convert him into a kindred. Complete the transformation requires Blood Gods to maintain the operation. Lin speculates that the Demon Emperor likely has no fewer than two Blood Gods and the support of cultivators at the God Transformation stage. Realizing the gravity of the situation, God decides that something earth-shattering is about to occur, prompting him to inform his master. Deep within Mount Kunlun, the Demon Emperor acknowledges the failure of his minions' attempts to deal with the human cultivators. Determined, he concludes that he must take matters into his own hands, setting the stage for a dramatic turn of events. After a fierce battle, all the cultivators gather to use their unique superpowers to seal the Demon Tower. With the Demon King defeated and the tower successfully sealed, Lin expresses gratitude to everyone for their support and announces the successful completion of their mission. The cultivators express their satisfaction in being able to contribute and mention their intention to return to their respective sects. Shu informs the group that they have also reported the mission's success to the Heavenly Court and expresses a desire to relax and have some fun in the remaining days. Lin, curious about their plans, asks the group about their next steps. He suggests visiting the Ministry of National Defense to explore military weaponry. Shu, on the other hand, is more interested in having fun and enjoying their free time. Lin playfully asked Brother Chang if he can acquire an intercontinental ballistic rocket for her, to which Tian interjects that such a request would require Sister Dongfeng's signature. Lin appears surprised by this revelation and questions whether Tian knows her. Tian offers to help if the price is right, and Lin agrees to exchange 30 spiritual rocks for his assistance. The scene then shifts to a concert venue, where Lin is captivated by the beautiful and graceful voice of a singer. The manager instructs Tian to wait before Dongfeng finishes her songs. Lin expresses her surprise at learning that Dongfeng is a celebrity affiliated with the Qianyu group and notes that Dongfeng typically invites guest singers to perform after her initial set. Dongfeng, after finishing her song, thanks her sister and requests jasmine flower tea for the makeup studio. She enters her studio, where Tian and Lin are waiting. Dongfeng questions Qian's sudden attendance at her concert, as Tian had previously claimed not to be interested in her songs. Tian simply replies that she missed her. Lin chimes in with a greeting. Dongfang playfully acknowledges their presence, mentioning that she is Fairy Mengyin. Tian and Lin reveal their true intentions, to obtain Dongfang's signature. Lin claims to be a fan of Dongfang and eagerly answers Dongfang's three questions to prove her fandom. She praises Dongfang's songs, correctly identifies the songs in her album, and compliments Dongfang's beauty. Chan interjects, pointing out that Lin has passed Dongfang's test and become her fan, and suggests that Dongfang should give him a signature. However, Dongfang playfully declines, Shin appeals to Dongfeng for a favor, asking him to do something for their sake. Lin presents a gift, 7th grade Frost Flash Pills, a token of appreciation for their first encounter. Lin explains the miraculous properties of the pills, mentioning how they can lighten skin, soothe the body, and enhance one's beauty. Dongfeng, in response, acknowledges Lin's generosity but expresses it in a friendly manner. Lin and Tian share a subtle glance, recognizing that their plan is unfolding as intended. After some contemplation, Dongfeng reluctantly agrees, though he emphasizes that he's doing it for Tian's sake. He hands over what seems to be a signed item, but Lin can't help but critique the quality of the signature, describing it as bad and assuming Dongfeng's reluctance to offer signatures to fans. Dongfeng, with a touch of irony, cautions Lin that the signature is meant to be kept private, hinting at potential consequences if it's revealed to others. Lin, meanwhile, wonders if his actions might make Dongfeng feel foolish or deceived, and if he would demand the return of his spiritual rocks. A sudden idea occurs to him, and he requests another signature from Dongfeng. She questions Lin's motive. He shocks everyone, explaining that he wants one signature to carry with her and another to place on her bed's headboard, a statement that raises eyebrows and suggests a deeper connection. Dongfeng, now pondering Lin's true intentions, agrees her request, possibly swayed by the idea of true love. Tian, observing the interaction, believes that Lin has successfully flirted with Dongfang. However, a sudden interruption occurs as a system message appears, presenting Lin with a formidable challenge. He is tasked with singing the song in front of an audience of 80,000 during a concert. Success will grant her a powerful cultivation technique, but failure will transform her into a fairy, and there is no option to refuse the mission. Lin is astonished by the difficulty of the mission and the potential consequence of becoming a fairy. Fueled by determination, he boldly requests to sing at Fairy Mengen's concert, further surprising those around her. 
Don Fang, suspicious of Lin's qualifications, questions her experience and achievements in performing and music. Lin humorously mentions her middle school's top 10 singing championship as her claim to fame. Tian, confused by the audacious request, reminds Dong Fang of the magnitude of his live concert and his status as the most popular celebrity in Asia. Despite the odds, Dong Fang surprisingly agrees to let Lin perform. The staff at the concert venue inquired about Lin's choice of soundtrack for her performance. Lin confidently states that he'll sing a cappella. As Dong Fang finishes her song, she surprises the audience by introducing a special guest herself, which is not her usual practice. She describes the guest as a new singer with great potential and teases that the upcoming song will be surprising. Lin takes the stage, feeling the energy of the 80,000-strong crowd as white glow sticks sway rhythmically in the air. He introduces himself and the audience's curiosity is peak. Lin announces that he will be singing the next song in a cappella, causing some confusion and intrigue among the audience. They wonder if this is the surprise Dong Fang mentioned and speculate about the song's content, even mentioning the possibility of it being a Daoist scripture. Dong Fang herself is curious about Lin's choice of an unfamiliar song and his decision to sing it a cappella. The staff explained that it was Lin's request, believing he could capture the audience's attention with it. Lin begins to sing and the audience is initially puzzled, unable to understand the lyrics. However, as Lin continues, Xu comes in surprise and joins him in the concert, some in the crowd find themselves drawn in by the rhythm despite not comprehending the words. Lin and Xu perform together on stage, and the entire audience becomes enthralled by their performance, breaking into applause to show their appreciation. After the successful performance, Lin receives a notification from the system, indicating that he has accomplished the special mission and obtained the divine inspection technique. He marvels at the power of this new technique, considering it a significant advantage. The system then activates another mission related to the soul development stage, involving beast cores. Lin expresses his frustration at the prospect of obtaining these cores, recognizing that they can only be condensed by powerful spiritual beasts. He contemplates seeking help from Chang to acquire a complete beast core. As the applause and praise from the audience fill the air, Lin is pleasantly surprised to see Xu in attendance at Dong Feng's concert. Xu explains that he had always wanted to attend a concert during his time in the mortal world, and this opportunity arose unexpectedly. Lin is delighted by the coincidence and their unexpected reunion. Chen, also present at the concert, approaches Lin and expresses her curiosity about sending. Dong Feng, too, is intrigued by Lin's recent performance and inquires about the song he sang. Lin describes the song as Dao Zhang, a book familiar to students at the Cultivation United University. He mentions that practicing Kiai while reading this book allows one to gain a deeper understanding of the Dao. Lin decides to give a copy of the book to Tian, who eagerly accepts it, much to Dong Feng's playful chagrin. The following day, Lin finds himself in the Hotel Furong, contemplating his mission from the Heavenly Court and reflecting on his past. He goes into a brief flashback, recalling an accident two years ago that claimed his mother's life and left his father in deep depression and addiction to gambling. His father's debts and gambling problems led to trouble with creditors and Lin found himself hiding from them. In the present, Lin visits Zhang, a person from his past who works in an office. Lin is there to repay a debt owed by his father, presenting five million and a card. Zhang questions if Lin's father has fled to Mingxuan, to which Lin is surprised. He mentions that it has been less than a year since his father's disappearance and wonders how he could have acquired such a large sum of money. Upon visiting Zhang, the person Lin went to repay his father's debts, Lin is informed that his father had already settled all the debts. Zhang reveals that Lin's father occasionally visited to make payments and clarifies that they had never kidnapped Lin. Zhang kindly requests that Lin reach out to his father to avoid further misunderstandings. Concerned about his father's whereabouts, Lin seeks assistance from his friend Huang to gather information. Huang informs Lin that his father borrowed money from a friend to settle his gambling debts and is currently working on a small residential project for a construction company. Huang promptly provides Lin with the address where his father can be found. Upon reaching the specified address, Lin is warmly welcomed by his father. Lin is taken aback to see his father looking older as if he had aged significantly in the past year. Lin's father invites him inside and offers to make a meal of noodles. Lin gratefully accepts the offer as they both enjoy the familiar taste of the noodles, reminiscent of their shared history. During their meal, Lin expresses concern for his father's well-being and offers to support him financially. Lin reveals that he possesses 350 million and a card due to his cultivation as an immortal. He explains that his newfound abilities grant him access to vast wealth. Lin playfully demonstrates some of his supernatural powers surprising his father. However, Lin's father quickly requests that he stop to prevent any unintended damage to their surroundings. 
Lin reassures his father that he can provide for him and suggests that they embark on a journey together, showcasing his ability to fly. Although initially hesitant due to his age, Lin's father ultimately agrees to accompany him, placing his trust in his son's newfound powers. With the promise of support and a renewed sense of hope, Lin and his father prepare to face the future together. Lin is at the National Cultivation Department, where he's arranged for an advanced member and teacher to take care of his father. He pays three years' worth of school fees, adding an extra 600 spiritual rocks as a tip, and gives his father some pills and 2,000 spiritual drops as spending money. Lin reassures his father and asks him to contact him if needed. The teacher accepts the payment but can't help but feel overwhelmed by the heavenly envoy's wealth. Lin takes his leave, leaving his father in the teacher's care. Suddenly, the teacher receives alarming news about the Taibei Sword Sect. It has been destroyed by the fiends and their sect leader, Bailing, has been killed. They are being pursued by a demon king and two blood kings. Lin is surprised to hear that one of the ten great Chinese sects has been destroyed. The teacher realizes that Chang and Xiao, who could have helped, are not in the city. Lin is the only heavenly envoy available. The teacher sends Lin the coordinates and informs him that the immortal Red Fox will provide support. Lin arrives at the coordinates and notices three red tails, which should indicate the presence of the immortal Red Fox. He wonders why she, a fox, is with human cultivators and not with the demons. However, he doesn't have time to dwell on it, as the Sword King and the Fiend King appear. The Fiend King boasts that Lin won't escape this time. The immortal Red Fox launches a surprise attack on the Fiend King with her three red tails, clearly signaling her intent. Lin understands that she wants him to finish off the Fiend King, but they need to leave quickly because two more Blood Kings are approaching. Lin attempts a powerful Void Shuddering Slash, but the Fiend King dismisses it as a weak technique from a 10th stage cultivator. He is determined to teach Lin a lesson and not let himself be easily intimidated. The Fiend King, despite being heavily injured, refuses to be intimidated by Lin. He is amazed at the strength of Lin, recognizing that a normal 10th stage Daoist body cultivator would have been killed by that punch. Lin attributes his survival to his training in the Earth Lotus Divine Technique and the consumption of Chang's Supreme Regenerative Pill. The Fiend King realizes that he cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lin in his current condition, fearing that he might be defeated by a 10th stage Daoist body cultivator. He decides to unleash his special Dragon Shadow Fist to gain the upper hand. Lin uses his Divine Inspection Technique to analyze the Fiend King's weaknesses, and the system helps him identify them. This revelation surprises the Fiend King as his special Dragon Shadow Fist is undone by a 10th stage Daoist body cultivator. Despite the dire situation, Lin remains composed and even thanks the Fiend King for the training opportunity. The Fiend King is inflamed by the idea of becoming a training partner to a mere cultivator. The Fiend King demonstrates his Lightning Spear, a powerful technique that summons lightning. Lin recognizes it as the Call Lightning Technique, an immortal technique derived from the Daoist technique of Thunder Origin, capable of guiding all the world's lightning. Fiend King refuses Lin's suggestion of becoming a training buddy, emphasizing the need to finish their battle. They engage in a fierce confrontation, both displaying remarkable power. In the end, and Lin emerges victorious in the battle, proving that he can stand against a formidable opponent with equal power. Meanwhile, the other cultivator was facing a female blood king, facing a formidable opponent. She relishes the thought of consuming the more powerful human cultivators for their delicious blood. Amid a fierce battle, tensions ran high between the blood king and the cultivator. Their clash had already left the blood king injured and her frustration boiled over. She resolved to teach the cultivator a lesson for daring to challenge her. The Blood King's irritation flared as she felt her moment being disrupted, referring to her opponent as a rodent attempting to spoil her victory. In response, the cultivator unleashed a powerful attack known as the Mountain Shaking Fist. The Blood King, though wounded, couldn't help but tease the cultivator, questioning their persistent flirtation despite their intense battle. She boasted about her regenerative abilities, likening the previous attacks to a mere appetizer. Ignoring the cultivator's plea to let them go, the Blood King demanded their help in healing her wounds, hinting at a darker intention, to drink their blood to restore her strength. But suddenly, the Blood King's tone shifted drastically. She realized her perilous situation and exclaimed, I am doomed. The cultivator, concerned for their friend Lin, inquired about their well-being. To the Blood King's shock, Lin had poisoned their blood, a tactic that ultimately led to the Blood King's downfall. The Cultivator marveled at the potency of the poison and urgently requested Lin's assistance in coating their blade with the deadly substance. However, another Demon King entered the fray, expressing annoyance at the Blood King's persistence. Lin rushed to aid the Red Fox, and the Demon King, realizing the odds were against them, contemplated escaping. The Cultivator wasn't about to let the Demon King slip away, and a confrontation ensued. In the heat of battle, the Demon King fell victim to the poison-laced blade, 
leading to their defeat. As the dust settled, Lin revealed the toll the battle had taken on them. They had been drained of blood by the Blood King and had their blood borrowed by Sword Saint King. Lin needed two bottles of Shen Bao as renal aid to recover from their ordeal. After Lin had successfully employed his blood to poison the Blood Kings, his reputation as the Supreme Poison Master rapidly spread throughout the Mortal Kingdom. News of his incredible feat reached the ears of well-respected leaders from ten different sects, all of whom sought to examine Lin's unique abilities. Using complex arrays, they meticulously scrutinized the structure of his blood, employing divine techniques to discern its distinct traits. Even after conducting tests on ordinary animals, their findings appeared inconclusive as Lin's blood exhibited no apparent differences from that of ordinary individuals. In the end, Lin consented to have 500 milliliters of his blood drawn to create deadly poison weapons, which eventually satisfied the leaders of the immortal world. They departed their hearts brimming with excitement and anticipation. However, Lin's sentiments were a stark contrast. Feeling the weight of Earth's dangerous nature, he yearned to return to the heavenly court. Opening the door, Lin was greeted by Tian, who had come to visit him. Tian, ever interested, examined Lin closely, questioning whether this seemingly ordinary body could truly exert the power to poison a blood king. Dong Feng playfully intervened, bringing some levity to the condition and reminding Tian to be thoughtful of Lin's current state. Lin greeted Dong Feng with warmth and gratitude for her presence. The three of them decided to take a stroll by the lake, appreciating the tranquility and purity of the Mortal Kingdom. Lin expressed his happiness after enjoying Dong Feng's cooking. Tian, with her typical bluntness, offered Lin an invitation to vacation in Tibet, but Dong Feng sensed that Tian's true motive lay in her concerns for her missing uncle Lin Lin readily agreed to join them on their journey to Tibet to search for him. Unexpectedly, a voice from the sky interrupted their conversation. It was Ms. Ying, a teacher from the Heavenly Court, who had tracked them down using the signet tablet Lin had received for his mission in the mortal world. She revealed that their team had a new objective involving the fiend emperor. Back at Lin's residence, Ms. Ying introduced earthly god Ming Yuan, a teacher specializing in trigram studies. They explained that their destination was the Tibetan ancient pool, a remote location at an altitude of 6,000 meters. Lin was instructed to make his preparations for the arduous journey ahead. Lin expressed doubts about the Fian Emperor's proximity to the ancient Tibetan pool, given that previous searches by cultivators had yielded no significant findings. Ms. Ying hinted at a surprise awaiting them. Ming Yuan, however, was more direct in his approach. He performed a reading for Lin, revealing a grim prediction. Lin would face grave danger on this journey into the unknown. Amidst a spooky atmosphere, the group of adventurers, led by Ying, arrived at the ancient pool. Ying, their guide, cautioned them to wait for the moon to rise before proceeding, taking the opportunity to explain the details of their mission. Ying outlined that the ancient kingdom was divided into four main territories. The White Bone Kingdom, accessible only to Taoists in the body stage the Soul Element Kingdom, reserved for Doists in the God Transformation stage, the Divine Separation, accessible to those in the Emptiness Reversion stage, and the Union Kingdom, which served as a connecting point. Lin, seeking clarity, inquired about their diverse team. Their group spanned Taoist Body, God Transformation, and Devotion stages, leading to the realization that each member would enter a different secret kingdom to fulfill their mission. Ying revealed the secret kingdom's history as a purification array, once used by the Black Feather tribe to cleanse the malevolent purification sword. Their mission involved entering these kingdoms, destroying monsters, and purifying the array. Mingyuan pointed out that the Fiend Emperor and Blood God were likely present in the Secret Kingdom, aiming to retrieve the purification sword by destroying the array through a technique accessible only to those in the transformation stage. However, Lin raised the issue that the path had been opened using mystic treasures, a feat achievable only by those at the transformation stage, Despite this, the group decided it was nearly time to embark on their mission and prepared accordingly. Yang invoked celestial powers, acknowledging the transient nature of their existence and the illusory nature of reality. Upon entering the White Bone Kingdom, Lin and the group found themselves surrounded by eerie illusions formed from yin energy. She assured them that these apparitions were not genuine threats. The pervasive silence and absence of life in the White Bone Kingdom unnerved the adventurers. Lin and Aksu made light of the situation with a playful exchange. A bizarre interaction with a skeleton revealed that the black fog in the kingdom was linked to the illusions. Lin and Steb realized that they needed to dispel these illusions to progress, and hundreds of concentrations of black fog remained. With a spark of inspiration, Lin proposed a solution, leaving the group poised to tackle the challenge ahead. Amid a complex encounter, white skeleton girls called out to Lin, desperately pleading for him to stay. But it was Seu who came to his aid. The past events had laid the groundwork for their current dilemma. 
Lin formulated a plan strategizing with Xu to unleash a powerful area damage dealing technique. He intended to draw the attention of the menacing white bone monsters, leading them toward their prepared trap. With this tactical advantage, they hoped to dispatch the creatures with ease. Now in the present moment, Xu announced that the damage dealing area was ready for use. Lin's attention was diverted to a peculiar discovery. He pointed out a mysterious doorway that appeared to lead to the Union Kingdom. However, their moment of intrigue was interrupted by the arrival of an unexpected figure. A woman with black wings, possibly hailing from the enigmatic Black Feather tribe. Suspicion and urgency filled the air as Lin recognized her as a potential bearer of the ominous evil purification sword. Their priority shifted to informing Ying, but the destruction of the pathway to the Union Kingdom posed a formidable obstacle. A new door unexpectedly materialized before them, revealing the ancient pool. Amidst the confusion, a familiar face, Brother Cheng, emerged. He was confused by their sudden teleportation into this mysterious location. Ying took charge, instructing Cheng to return to the Bei and Taoist temple and urgently relay a message to the heavenly court regarding the presence of Annie. As they gazed up at the sky, a disturbing sight captured their attention. An enemy cultivator informed Lady Annie about the completion of the Sword Spirit's transformation. With a grim declaration, she granted permission for the Fian Emperor to feast on the blood of the nearby cultivators, casting a dark shadow over their already dire circumstances. Chang urgently called out to Lin and Xiao, beckoning them to ascend to safety. Lady Annie and their formidable adversary believed that the cultivators who had intruded upon the secret kingdom were sent by the heavenly court and deemed them worthy of elimination. Chaos ensued and Lin found himself in a precarious position. He faced an attack from Lady Annie. But his resilience was evident as he deflected the assault with a seemingly indestructible alloy brick. Lady Annie was intrigued by Lin's determination and questioned how he intended to withstand her impending attack. However, before the confrontation escalated further, Cheng intervened with a warning for Lin to be vigilant. Ying stepped in to shield Lin from Lady Annie's attack, putting her safety at risk. Lin was taken aback by her sacrifice and questioned her motives. Ying revealed her selfless reasoning, emphasizing that Lin and Xiao were her students and she implored them to flee to safety to preserve their lives. Cheng decoded the call for a hasty retreat, but Lin was unwavering in his determination to succeed. Lin recognized that their chances of escaping the clutches of an opponent from the emptiness reversion stage, while they were at the soul development stage, were slim. However, he refused to squander Ying's sacrifice and pleaded with Cheng not to abandon the opportunity they had been given. He acknowledged the gravity of the situation and revealed his plan to utilize a second chance. Lin expressed his gratitude to Ying and made a pivotal decision, touching the button that activated the regenerative pill, aware that it might be their only lifeline in the face of imminent danger. Amid a confrontation, Lin found himself facing off against Annie. She questioned whether she had truly underestimated him. Annie unleashed a powerful attack causing Lin to sustain injuries and struggle for breath. Lin was devastated at this moment and couldn't fight. Amidst this life-threatening situation, a mysterious system offered Lin a choice. He could sacrifice one-fifth of his life force in exchange for unimaginable power. Lin, desperate to survive, agreed to the proposition. In an instant, Lin underwent a remarkable transformation, becoming a formidable cultivator with newfound strength and abilities. His friend Chexu couldn't contain his relief upon seeing Lin miraculously alive. Lin, in turn, inquired about the well-being of Miss Ying, showing his concern for her condition. Cheng explained that Miss Ying's energy had been continuously drained by the evil purification sword endangering her life. Lin, now empowered by his recent transformation, assured her that he could restore her drained energy, urging her to hold on a little longer. Lin's basic yet potent healing divine technique had the remarkable ability to mend wounds afflicted with remnant emptiness reversible energy. Meanwhile, Annie, sensing the growing threat that Lin posed, unleashed a devastating technique known as the Darkness of Origin. Witnessing Annie's actions, other cultivators nearby were taken aback, realizing the dangerous nature of the technique. The darkness of origin did not discriminate between allies and enemies, endangering everyone in its path. As panic and chaos erupted among the enemy cultivators, one observer, Mingyuan, couldn't help but wonder about the mysterious woman with black wings and the incredible power she wielded. In the center of an expansive array, Lin and his companions stood, facing a dangerous situation. Among them was Ying, who directed Lin's attention upward, while Lin himself remained composed, reassuring her. Recognizing the need for action, Lin ordered the small array to disperse and their unity shattered. The tension escalated as they confronted the danger posed by Annie, who expressed disbelief at their boldness. Lin, ever determined, assured Annie that her wounds had been fully healed and vowed to seek vengeance on her behalf. Annie, puzzled by Lin's presence, inquired about his identity, 
to which he enthusiastically revealed himself as Miss Ying's student. Annie's amusement grew as she wondered how Lin had appeared before her. Lin, driven by his resolve, promised to repay Annie's deeds a thousandfold. Amidst the commotion, Lin found the noise unbearable. With unwavering determination, Lin invoked powerful words likening heaven to a web and earth to a slaughter. The enemy cultivator, taken aback, noticed an unusual pressure in the surroundings, causing him to question the events unfolding before his eyes. As Lin's powers manifested, the fiends and kindred all fell, leaving their adversaries bewildered. Shu and Mingyuan watched in amazement, surprised by Lin's miraculous abilities. Annie, who had once viewed Lin with disrespect, was now confronted with his formidable strength. Yet Ying, wise and compassionate, reminded everyone that power alone did not determine one's worth. In her eyes, Lin was merely her student, and she emphasized the importance of not judging others solely by their abilities. Lin, however, remained resolute in his mission to protect and avenge his teacher. Concerned for Lin's well-being, Su reached out to him, but Lin seemed to have fallen unconscious, while in reality, he had slipped into a deep slumber. Far from the immediate turmoil, on the outskirts of the continent Taichi, someone noted in the beginning of repairs in the heavens. Recognizing the necessity of their involvement, they prepared to join the effort. Lin had been asleep for three long days, causing concern among their companions, Hexu and Ying. When Lin finally woke up, they felt as great as before, ready to explore the mysterious gifts and spoils they had acquired during their battles with fiends and from master cultivators. Ying had completed the transmutation process for three spatial rings they had obtained, and she offered them to Lin. Excitement filled the air as they opened these rings, revealing an astonishing treasure trove within. Inside, they found 326 pills and 72 talismans, all crafted by cultivators at the soul development stage and beyond. The power of these talismans surpassed Lin's abilities. Next, they examined a spatial ring Lin had obtained from Annie. To their surprise, it held an extra-dimensional space the size of a hundred zhang, making it immensely valuable. However, when they counted the contents, they discovered it contained only about a hundred spiritual rocks. The exchange rate between origin rocks and spiritual rocks was explained, making Lin an instant millionaire. Lin's happiness soared, and they couldn't believe their sudden wealth. But the surprises didn't end there. Su presented a dragon soul core that could greatly enhance a cultivator's powers after reaching the god transformation stage. Ying showed an immortal relic known as the Boundary Piercing Nail, a powerful weapon capable of destroying boundaries between spaces or arrays. Lin then uncovered a peculiar sword, the Evil Purification Sword, which had a mysterious aura. They also found a piece of cloning with its tag still intact and exclusive protective gear known as Blue Hawk Garb. Lin wanted to gift the dress-like garb to Ying as a token of appreciation, but she politely declined, leading to an offer from Su to buy it for 300,000 spiritual rocks. Lin insisted on a friendly price of 100,000, planning to give it to Xu later. Two days later, Lin decided to return to the heavenly court, leaving their father a spatial ring containing life-saving pills. Amid tears of gratitude and farewells, Lin and So eventually made their way back to the heavenly court. As they arrived, an anonymous voice welcomed them back. In the presence of the greatest emperor Zui, Ying showed her respect, though the emperor insisted that formalities were unnecessary. Lin was in awe as she saw a true god for the first time. Ying explained that the great emperor was one of the four great rulers of the heavenly court, bearing the title of Lord of the Stars and Master of the Universe. He possessed vast knowledge, having comprehended the mysteries of heaven and earth, as well as the fate and misfortune of the universe. Emperor Zui acknowledged the successful completion of their mission in the kingdom and took responsibility for the flaws in the Three Extreme Array. As a token of his appreciation, he extended invitations to both Lin and So for alchemy, considering Lin a hero of their venture. Lin gratefully accepted the Emperor's gift, the evil purification sword, and expressed her thanks. With that, Emperor Zue returned to the Polaris Palace, leaving them in amazement. It was surprising to discover that the Black Feather tribe had a way to enter the Wa Kingdom. Back at the Heavenly Cultivation University, word of Lin's achievements spread among the students. They discussed her role in destroying the Black Feather tribe and her impressive feat of entering and leaving the tribe seven times. Excited students approached Lin, asking for autographs and handshakes, but their teacher reminded them to focus on their studies. Teacher Ling announced that their freshman year was coming to an end and revealed the location of their final exam, Anding City in Chu Province, Shillong State. The exam involved slaying 3,000 vile beasts within a set time frame, with their teacher promising not to interfere during the examination period. Upon arriving in Shillong State, Lin was struck by the province's appearance, which she described as resembling the ancient world. Chu corrected her, explaining that this was the modern era and the provincial capital of Shillong State, where the Panlong resided. 
Lin recalled that Su was the princess from the king of royalties ruling the Zixing state. Their teacher then instructed the students that the goal was to run from the provincial capital to Anding city, emphasizing the importance of covering a thousand miles in a day as part of their training. With that, the exam began. A group of students moved with astonishing speed, their feet pounding the earth as they sprinted with unwavering determination. Among them, Lin, with a face filled with determination, had finally reached his destination. The students marveled at the newfound ability to soar through the air using the flying sword technique, a skill they had to work to master. As they soared, a teacher's voice echoed, emphasizing the importance of teamwork in their upcoming hunt. Each team was to consist of five individuals, making a total of 20 teams. Among these teams, Lin found himself appointed as the leader with teammates Lu, Miao, Zhang, and Sun at his side. He couldn't help but wonder if they held him in high regard, perhaps even seeing him as a godlike figure. With the teacher's command, the hunt commenced. Lin observed the defensive stance of a formidable adversary, mentally preparing himself for the challenges ahead. During their hunt, a fearsome beast emerged. With precision and skill, Mao unleashed the power of her spatial ring, swiftly defeating the creature. Similarly, Zong unsheathed his blade, swiftly dispatching another of the menacing creatures. Lu, with grace and determination, struck down yet another of the vile beasts, asserting their dominance over the wild creatures. Their fellow mates were evident as Lu proclaimed that none of the creatures were a match for their formidable team. Zong speculated that with their current pace, acquiring the required resources would be a simple task. Only 10 beasts per day stood between them and their target. Lin, ever the strategist, proposed an even more ambitious goal, suggesting they aim for a staggering 20 beasts a day. But before they could act on this decision, a sudden eruption nearby drew their attention. Driven by curiosity and a sense of responsibility, Lin and his teammates hastened toward the source of the disturbance. There, they were met with a swarm of awful mosquitoes attacking helpless humans. Without hesitation, Lin and his team engaged in combat, their flying sword techniques and martial skills combining to fend off the relentless attack. The humans, their saviors, expressed gratitude for their timely intervention. Among the grateful survivors, a figure named Su stepped forward as the leader of the hunting expedition. With a tone of urgency, Su revealed their primary objective, an elusive spiritual mountain concealed within the 10,000 mountains bearing precious immortal fruits. As the leader continued, the story took a surprising twist. It appeared that the immortal fruits were guarded by a formidable adversary, the Golden Eye Monkey King. Shu recognized the power and potential in Lin and his team, extending an enticing offer, a partnership to acquire the coveted fruits. In exchange for their assistance, Shu promised them six of these extraordinary fruits, leaving the decision in their capable hands. Beneath the looming presence of Mount Gowa, a monkey, burdened with the task of patrolling the mountain, had inadvertently strayed far from his intended path. As he wandered through the mortal kingdom, he found himself surrounded by a group of strangers, their weapons poised menacingly. Fear gripped the monkey's heart as he stammered, begging for mercy. Their leader, Lin, displayed a flicker of compassion, offering a chance at salvation in exchange for crucial information. The monkey, trembling in the face of his captors, revealed the tidings of a gathering between the ugly monkey and the oxen king to partake in the legendary immortal fruits. Before the monkey could share more, Su intervened, rendering him unconscious. Time was of the essence, and Su urged the group to hurry towards their destination. Su, harboring knowledge of a hidden bathing spot, proposed they seize the opportunity. As they pressed forward, the scene shifted to the gathering of the oxen king, who expressed anticipation for the swift maturation of the black blood immortal fruits. The fruits held the promise of a significant power boost, possibly even unlocking new abilities. However, a sense of caution loomed as the ugly monkey emphasized that only one fruit should be consumed at present. Yet the Oxen King had invited the Silver-Winged King and the giant frog of the demon Lotus, raising concerns of betrayal in the ugly monkey's eyes. Tensions escalated into a fierce battle between the two. As the dust settled, the arrival of the giant frog and the demon Lotus tipped the balance of power in favor of the newcomers, who seized control of the situation. The Oxen King's ambitions were thwarted, and his dreams of indulging in the fruits seemed to fade. Amid the commotion, Lin stepped forward, confronting the intruders and swiftly claiming the coveted immortal fruits. With their newfound prize in hand, Lin's team was ready to make their escape. The giant frog, however, harbored no intentions of allowing them to leave unscathed. In the face of impending conflict, the fate of the immortal fruits remained uncertain, hanging in the balance as a battle between Lin and their adversaries loomed on the horizon. As the chaos of battle erupted around them, the giant frog lashed out with its enormous tongue, snaring Miao in its sticky grasp. Panic rippled through the group as they watched their companion's predicament, turning to their leader, Lin, for guidance. With unwavering determination, Lin unleashed his next move, 
a formidable ice wall that rose between them and their adversaries. However, the ice wall's resistance began to wane under the relentless assault of their foes. Lin urged his comrades to make a hasty escape as the ice wall's integrity crumbled. Their retreat was met with a defiant declaration from the silver-winged king, who marveled at Lin's possession of the Soul Development Stage Talisman. The tension remained palpable as the group attempted to flee. Lin, refusing to be subdued, summoned the chains of the Cloud Dragon, revealing yet another potent talisman. The giant frog, still reeling from the unexpected display of power, found itself further challenged by the ugly monkey's surprising intervention. Confusion reigned as the oxen came questioned the ugly monkey's actions. Injured and cornered, the ugly monkey explained that despite knowing the humans had taken the immortal fruits, he preferred them to fall into their hands than those of the oxen king, who we deem a traitor. Lu urged Lin to seize the opportunity to escape while the ugly monkey held off their pursuers, but Lin remained steadfast, expressing his desire to protect their newfound ally. The ugly monkey, however, questioned Lin's decision considering the vast difference in their strengths. The oxen king viewed Lin's bravery as an opportunity, eager to see how many talismans he possessed. Undeterred, Lin unleashed a potent technique, the Endless Divine Technique, invoking forbidden talismans. A fierce confrontation ensued, with the giant frog, silver-winged king, and the oxen king collectively attacking Lin. To their astonishment, Lin wielded a multitude of soul development talismans, which ultimately culminated in a powerful explosion. Despite their combined efforts, the trio remained fragile in the face of Lin's overwhelming might. As the dust settled, Mio couldn't help but express her admiration for Lin's remarkable display. Lin, humbled by the praise, reflected on the exhilaration of using such incredible power. The ugly monkey, severely injured but grateful for their assistance, extended his thanks. Lin, somewhat puzzled by the gesture, questioned the ugly monkey's gratitude considering they had taken the immortal fruits. The ugly monkey, however, saw it differently. He believed that falling into the hands of the human cultivators was a preferable fate to being controlled by traitors. Furthermore, he appreciated Lin's willingness to stay and save him from peril. Lin's compassion shone through as he contemplated leaving one of the valuable immortal fruits for the ugly monkey. Touched by Lin's kindness, the ugly monkey was genuinely moved, prompting Lu to remind them that they were not thieves or robbers. Lin, extending an invitation, suggested that the ugly monkey join their group and venture beyond their current confines. He believed that through adventures and experiences, the ugly monkey could one day return to protect his tribe and the divine peaches himself. During their journey, Lin generously distributed immortal fruits to the members of their hunting expedition, ensuring each of his team members received the precious fruit. The teachers in a tanning city praised the achievements of Tan Wei's group for capturing 15 vile beasts, surpassing their target. Unexpectedly, Lin and his companions returned with an unusual addition to their group, a monkey. The news of this monkey's arrival raised eyebrows and prompted speculation, with some wondering if it might be the legendary monkey king, Sun Wukong. The teacher inquired about the new addition, and Lin introduced the monkey as his Eidolon, affectionately referring to it as the Ugly Monkey King. Despite initial surprise, the teacher accepted the monkey into their group, recognizing the potential value of the highly intelligent spiritual beast. Sue offered her congratulations to Lin on his new pet, but Lin clarified that the monkey was not his pet, rather, it was his brother. Sue found this intriguing and complimented Lin with a smile. As the conversation continued, Sue revealed her accomplishment, the slaying of a crimson flame Dominic Tiger, and the extraction of his beast core as a gift for Lin. In return, Lin offered his pills and acknowledged their role as peers who should support one another. The night ended with a commitment to working diligently in the future. Amidst these interactions, the ugly monkey chimed in with its observations, stating that all human cultivators looked the same to it, much like how Lin might see a sea of identical monkeys. Lin, however, assured the monkey that he could always distinguish it from the rest because it was his brother. The next day, Lin and his team resumed their search for vile beasts, achieving a commendable result of 36 captured creatures, during a moment of reflection, Mio asked Lin if he was contemplating life under the starry night sky. Lin shared his recent realization about Earth and the vastness of the Teichu continent, leaving him pondering who had defined this immense realm. Mio encouraged Lin to seek answers if he genuinely desired them. The following day, however, their progress faltered as they managed to capture only 13 beasts, raising concerns about their declining performance. Suddenly, a deafening sound interrupted their concerns. A stampede was approaching. As the distant rumbling sound intensifies, Lin and his companions grow alarmed. The ugly monkey admits uncertainty about the stampede's size, but estimates there might be thousands of vile beasts. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, Lin decides they must return to the city and inform everyone. Back in Anding City, Kasu approaches their homeroom teacher with an unexpected announcement. The students reveal their plan to use a grade 3 spiritual flower to create a stampede. 
which has successfully lured around a thousand vile beasts toward the city. The teacher, visibly shocked, processes this information. Lin and his team arrive in the city just as chaos begins to erupt. People are already aware of the approaching stampede, and the earth trembles beneath their feet as the vile beasts draw nearer. Witnessing the city's preparations for battle, Lin marvels at how their homeroom teacher has transformed into a determined and resolute figure. The teacher rallies the city's defenders as they brace for the impending conflict. As the stampede reaches the city walls, the number of vile beasts exceeds 2,000. The homeroom teacher leads the charge, displaying remarkable composure and resolve. The battle unfolds with cultivators utilizing various techniques to confront the vile beasts. Lin engages in combat using his mountain-shaking fist technique, contributing to their apparent victory. However, a sudden and alarming development disrupts their optimism. The city's gate is destroyed by a mysterious black spear, allowing vile beasts to breach the city's defenses. In response, the teacher orders those who are weaker to retreat to safety, emphasizing the need to maintain the aerial advantage. The teacher's recognition of the black spear hints at a deeper mystery, leaving a sense of foreboding in the intense battle. With determination, the teacher departs, promising to return soon as the battle between humans and vile beasts intensifies. During the chaos, a determined beast sought to capture a male cultivator to become her husband, her intentions concealed behind mischievous laughter. The tension in the air was palpable as the beast named Sue was attacked, sending shockwaves of concern through the students who bore witness to the nightmarish scene. The beast, undeterred by the students' distress, boldly entered the gate and unleashed its fury upon them, leaving a trail of grievous injuries in its wake. Its appetite for the life force of human cultivators seemed insatiable, and it reveled in the prospect of feasting upon its helpless victims. However, a sudden turn of events disrupted the beast's reign of terror. The Monkey King, wielding his powerful rod, struck a decisive blow that left the beast wounded. With unwavering determination, he continued his assault, ultimately subduing the formidable creature and returning it to its rightful place. The Monkey King, hailing from Mount Goa, had embarked on a quest to find his idol in the western skies, and his valiant actions at that moment reflected his steadfast resolve. Meanwhile, another cultivator named Lin entered the fray, accompanied by a menacing red beast. Lin drew his sword with unwavering bravery, engaging the creature in an intense battle. His every strike was marked by determination and courage, and as the confrontation reached its climax, Lin emerged victorious, the defeated beast lying vanquished at his feet. Yet the battlefield was far from empty, and the relentless tide of beasts pressed on. Lin found himself encircled by the relentless horde, their intent fixed solely on him. He called out to them, pleading for a reason, proclaiming his innocence, and urging them to reconsider their focus on him. With no alternative, Lin contemplated unleashing God's transformation stage, a powerful ability fueled by a needed talisman. As he summoned the might of the fearless Sword of Ice, a newfound strength coursed through him. His resolve was unyielding, and he was prepared to confront any challenge that lay before him. As the tension reached its zenith, all the surrounding beasts, undeterred and unafraid, began to move toward Lin. And he was shocked that all of them were not afraid of dying. Lin by the relentless beasts, panic overtook him. Desperation seeped into his voice as he pleaded for salvation, specifically calling out to Xu for aid. Xu reassured Lin, promising to come to his rescue. As Lin continued to be chased by the relentless horde, Xu's incredible speed became readily apparent as he surged forward to confront the pursuing beasts. In a magnificent display of power, an eruption of energy emanated from Kaxu as he engaged the creatures. While one particularly aggressive beast closed in on Lin, poised to inflict harm, Lin channeled his techniques with precision, ultimately defeating the menacing creature with a devastating call lightning technique. Lin's triumph in defeating the spiritual beast in solo combat marked a significant achievement, evident from his triumphant declaration. With three beast cores now in his possession, Lin harbored a mysterious plan involving the summoning of Shenlong, a secret he held close to his heart. Meanwhile, Su continued to engage in triumph over the remaining beasts, unaware of Lin's hidden agenda. The following day, their battle with the beasts reached its conclusion, and the scene transitioned to their teacher standing before the lifeless body of one of the formidable creatures. The teacher carefully examined the lifeless beast's hand, observing the lingering black marks that suggested the culprit behind the thrown black spear. Although the hand bore these marks, the teacher couldn't sense the aura of the original beast, raising suspicions that it might have been a being from a different race. Puzzlingly, the strange light within the creature's body had disappeared. As the teacher gazed up at the sky, a sense of foreboding weighed on their heart. It felt an impending unease, prompting a decision to return and clear out the remaining vile beasts. In Anding City, the teacher addressed the victorious group, commending them for their remarkable achievement in slaying a thousand vile beasts during the stampede battle. 
Having surpassed their targets within an hour, the teacher praised their exceptional performance and granted them the evening to celebrate. In a remote mountainous area, King Singh conversed with the Beast God, acknowledging the loss of several generals during the mission, but deeming it a success nonetheless. The Beast God received a mysterious reward, a black lotus seed, expressing gratitude to King Singh. However, the Beast God couldn't help but feel the challenges of serving such a demanding leader. King Singh reminded the Beast God to maintain a low profile and avoid attracting any attention, leaving the Beast God in a state of anxiety and relief. At another location, six formidable warriors of the Black Feather tribe gathered, led by their master. They discussed a cultivator who possessed the event purification sword, estimating his power to be at the tenth stage of the Taoist body. Despite being outnumbered and attacked by four spiritual beasts, this cultivator had miraculously achieved victory, leading them to speculate about his true identity. They marveled at his ability to defeat true Queen Annie without her deploying the Heavenly Star Killer Array. The master, sensing that the cultivator might have detected their manipulations, decided to retreat to the castle and cancel all further actions, prioritizing safety over confrontation. The six warriors unanimously supported their master's prudent decision, recognizing the wisdom in it. The master, while aware of the potential repercussions for defying orders, prioritized self-preservation over following in the footsteps of Queen Annie. With that, they made the critical choice to withdraw from the situation and reassess their strategies. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation as everyone's eyes remained fixated on the beast cores before them. The odor emanating from the cores was less than pleasant, eliciting concern from the onlookers. Xu voiced a word of caution, warning Lin about the explosive energy contained within these beast cores. She questioned Lin's intent to consume them, prompting Lin's internal reflection on his true intentions. Lin contemplated the instructions of the mysterious system he followed, which dictated that he must swallow three beast cores to advance to the soul development stage. Carefully considering his options, Lin selected the core from the white-furred giant bear, believing it to be the safest choice due to its frosty aura. As he consumed the first core, some discomfort washed over him, but he remained composed. His stomach felt a chill, but he reassured those around him that he was fine aside from the cold sensation. The second core, obtained from the crimson flame demon tiger, caused Lin to squirm uncomfortably. He described a pleasant warmth enveloping his body, much to the curiosity of those around him. The final core, extracted from the lion, was consumed by Lin, and the group watched with bated breath as he awaited a miracle. Xu inquired about Lin's well-being, and Lin reported that the three cores were converging in his stomach, but nothing had occurred yet. The system declared that the objective was achieved, signaling Lin's progression into the spirit nursing phase. The teacher and others sensed an unstable shift in the surrounding energy, indicating that Lin was on the verge of a breakthrough into the nurturing phase. Amidst these profound changes, Lin's loyal companion, Flower, wished to be placed on her master's shoulder for support. Lin underwent a series of transformations, constantly changing positions as he moved through an unconventional and unstable phase. The teacher recognized that Lin was about to form his soul root, a significant step in his cultivation journey. As Lin experienced this pivotal moment, he made a startling discovery, something that left him puzzled and intrigued. It was the flowered shadow that took the formation of a human, but she came out without clothes. Xu, sensing the need for Lin to close his eyes, took a rather unusual approach. She smacked Lin's head with a stick, rendering him unconscious. Lin, upon awakening, questioned the method, suggesting that covering his eyes might have been a gentler approach. As Lin lay unconscious, Flower, Xiao, adorned herself in the clothes provided by Xu. She inquired if Flower had successfully formed her demon core, to which she confirmed with enthusiasm. She described the special connection she felt with her master during his breakthrough. Stu expressed his fondness for Flower's flower form, finding her cuter in that state. However, Flower preferred her current form due to its practicality and comfort, mentioning her ability to undergo photosynthesis. With everything settled, Axu announced his intention to retire to his room, leaving Ugly Monkey in charge of Lin's care. The rest of the group departed, leaving Lin in the company of Ugly Monkey. The following day, Flower Xiao excitedly greeted Lin, who had awakened from his breakthrough into the spirit nursing phase. Lin expressed his eagerness to examine his spiritual roots and was surprised to discover a pearl instead. Confusion washed over him and he wondered if it was all a dream. Lin, believing he was dreaming, made a bizarre request, asking Flower to hit him with her full power. She complied and Lin, unable to withstand the force, fell to the ground. He chastised Flower for her strength and jokingly accused her of wanting to harm him. At that moment, Xu entered unusually and Lin realized that Flower's kick had propelled him into Xu's room, breaking the wall. Xu, angered by the unexpected intrusion, kicked Lin out of the house. 
Lin attempted to explain the misunderstanding, desperately trying to convey that it was not intentional, but Su's anger prevailed and he expelled Lin from the premises. Lin found himself outside, bewildered by the unexpected turn of events, desperately trying to clear up the confusion. Lin, bewildered by his situation, questioned what he had done to deserve his current predicament. He pondered the mysterious presence within his body and after some examination, identified it as a divine technique fire. This pearl possessed properties similar to a soul root but appeared to be beast core instead. The next day, as the year-end exam continued, everyone returned to their tasks, hunting beasts and homing their skills. Lin discovered that his strikes, following his breakthrough into the soul development stage, emitted powerful beams of light, showcasing his newfound strength. Meanwhile, Lu announced that the lunch for the day would consist of a Stormblade bird's egg, further emphasizing the practical nature of their training. Lin, while practicing, suddenly found himself at a remarkable height, with Lu and others appearing diminutive below. Realizing his precarious position, Lin decided it was time to land safely back on the ground. As he descended, Lin couldn't help but praise Debei, finding comfort in the familiar and reliable worm. However, he soon took inventory of the impressive weapons he possessed, including the evil purification sword, the immortal relic boundary-piercing nail, the demonic blood dragon blade, and the great shield of the hundred ghosts, all of which were stored within his spatial ring. Lin reflected on the differences between a sword and a blade, finding the latter to be more to his liking due to its wider back. He also noted the small size and black appearance of the alloyed brick, which seemed different from his previous experiences. Ugly Monkey, overhearing something unusual, alerted the group and they turned their attention to Lin, who was joyfully flying on the black brick. Everyone was left in a state of bewilderment, their eyes fixed on Lin in amazement and surprise. As Lin relished the delicious meal, Ugly Monkey couldn't help but express his surprise at Lin's unorthodox mode of transportation, a flying brick in contrast to others who manipulated swords for flying. The taste of the fresh eggs and the subtle roasting flavor delighted Lin's senses. Ugly Monkey, however, thought Lin's satisfaction was limited and proceeded to inform him about a rare and unique beast called the Rainbow Bull, known not only for its taste but also its ability to produce different flavors simultaneously. The creature was said to dwell deep within the 10,000 mountains, specifically in the Southwest Hills, approximately 250 kilometers away. Realizing that it would take them three days to reach the location at their current speed, Lin decided to make use of his flying brick. Excitedly, he invited everyone to join him as they set off for the Hills of the Wind. Upon arriving in the picturesque Hills of the Wind, Lin marveled at the lush greenery, the strong breeze, and the invigorating freshness in the air. He also noticed a towering mountain called Mount Yun, reputed to be around 10,000 zhang tall, seemingly reaching the very sky itself. Lin recognized the mountain as an ideal place to learn a new technique. The system provided him with the first stage of Wing's Grace, jumping off a 10,000 zhang high cliff. Lin distributed a talisman of sense to his companions, explaining that it would be effective within a 5 kilometers radius. He instructed them to stay near the hills of the wind and expressed his intention to look for them later. Ugly Monkey cautioned Lin about the dangers posed by the vile beasts in the area, advising him to remain vigilant. Lin, meanwhile, soared through the air on his black brick, observing the various animals and birds in their natural habitat. As Lin continued his journey, he stumbled upon an unexpected sight, an enchanting landscape with cherry blossoms. Intrigued, he approached only to experience a painful impact as if he had encountered some sort of protective array. He called out, wondering if anyone was present, and his gaze settled on a girl engrossed in calligraphy. Lin called out in search of someone but received no response. He found himself captivated by the scenic beauty and decided to activate his divine inspection technique, attempting to analyze the weaknesses in the array that had protected the area. With his keen observation, he quickly identified a vulnerability. However, just as Lin was about to make a move, an explosion disrupted the tranquility. Startled but amazed by the beauty around him, Lin noticed a woman standing some distance away, clearly angered by his presence. Lin greeted the woman and apologized for intruding without permission. The woman was perplexed and asked how he had managed to breach her array and reach the mountaintop. Lin casually replied that he had destroyed it due to his power. The woman was taken aback but acknowledged Lin's capability. She inquired about his reason for trespassing on her mountaintop. Lin casually mentioned that he wanted to do a bungee jump from the mountain for fun. However, when Lin glanced at a painting made by the woman, he couldn't contain his laughter. This angered the woman and she punched him in frustration. Lin screamed for help as the woman continued to beat him, shocked by her sudden aggression. Eventually, the woman named Lin Junjun calmed down and introduced herself. Lin reciprocated and expressed his confusion about her reaction. Junjun speculated that Lin might have been sent by the heavens to test for Dao. Despite her initial anger, she exercised patience and attempted to get to know him better. 
Lin explained his true purpose for coming to the mountaintop. He genuinely wanted to jump off for fun. With their conversation concluded, Lin prepared to leave, apologizing for disturbing Jun Jun. Before parting, he couldn't help but comment on the comical nature of the crane painting, bursting into laughter once again. As Lin laughed, he accidentally fell down the mountain, leaving Jun Jun behind. She remarked that she would remember him, curious about the peculiar encounter. 